Good morning. It's 8.30, Wednesday, February 23rd. I'm Desiree Frazier, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, the state Senate throws its tax cut proposal into the ring. Then we talk with U.S. Representative Benny Thompson and a new plan from the Attorney General's office, Eyes of Future Without Abortion. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Mississippi Senate passed its tax plan yesterday. The Senate bill would cut one bracket of the state income tax gradually over a period of years. It would also shade the grocery tax as well as the cost of a car tag. Overall, it's less aggressive than the House plan, which would completely eliminate the income tax. Senator Josh Harkins, who chairs the Senate Finance Committee, tells MPB's Kobe Vance the milder approach is the right fit for Mississippi. This tax plan would be a measured approach at reducing uh, the tax liability on Mississippi citizens. Uh, it will provide instant relief at the grocery store when uh, going and buying food. Uh, it also puts in a rebate check to the uh, into the pockets of Mississippi working uh, citizens. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it's just a culmination. There are a lot of levers to pull in tax uh, when you're dealing with taxes. And so what we felt like, we would provide some relief on the grocery tax. We would provide some relief with the rebate. We'd also get out of the car tag business. It's not a big number, but it, it does. It's not the state that's uh, collecting the fees. It's, it's local. So if you, you know, if you have a problem with your, your car tag, it's a local issue. It's not a lot of fees put on by the state. So, um, you know, what we're trying to do is take a measured approach. But in, in all of this, we have to look at how much recurring revenue are, are we going to be doing without and to make sure that we, pro, you know, fund our priorities. Uh, we came in and passed the teacher pay raise the first, second week of the session. We've got, uh, you know, things that we have to fund, whether it's with corrections, whether it's uh, child protective services. Um, there's, you know, things that are out of our control, so to speak, that are going to require additional funding. Uh, our health insurance for state employees. So there, there's a lot of things that we have to say uh, grace over that we need to, to make sure we fund. Um, but how much can we afford to give back to the Missis- to Mississippi working families, working people? And I think what we want to do is we want to try to take a measured approach that implements it in a short order, and then we can come back and reassess and see where we are and uh, take another you know bite of the apple. Uh, I don't think many states have ever just – set a, a goal in mind of something like this and, and just sent the ship off to sea and never see it come back. I think they they take measured approaches. It's bites of the apple one at a time, and they implement it, and they come back and reassess after that's been implemented. And I think what you'll have is you'll have our 2016 tax cut that will be fully implemented by the time this is done. So we'll have two big tax cuts that are fully implemented, and then we can reassess and see what the environment is, see what the economy looks like. Who knows what the economy is going to look like? Um, but it, this is a measured approach that I think is something that we can Mississippi can afford to do without raising taxes on anybody. A large part of the conversation behind this has been twofold. One, to make Mississippi more competitive with other states surrounding us like Texas, Florida, and uh, Tennessee, and also to make Mississippi more attractive for people to move back into the state. Uh, what do you think this could do to make those happen? Well, I think it helps. I think there are other factors you have to consider. You can't just look at income tax. I mean, ask anybody in Texas if they enjoy paying their property taxes. Ask people in, in these other states if they enjoy 9% sales tax. Ask them if they, uh, you know, do you, how many services do you tax? Uh, you know, sales tax in Mississippi is taxed on 60 to 70 different services. South Dakota doesn't have an income tax, but they tax 126 different services. You go get your hair cut, you pay sales tax. You get your landscape, uh, your lawn uh, cut, you pay sales tax. They, you pay sales tax on everything there. Uh, in Florida, they, they put taxes on real estate transactions. Um, Every state has different things where they they get revenue from the citizens that's different than us. So it's not it's not fair just to look at you know oh Texas doesn't have an income tax. Well they got horrible property taxes, and and so I think there's a trade off. You know if if you want to go to Texas model, then let's up the property taxes for everybody. Let's charge sales tax on all the different services they do. Uh, we obviously don't have oil revenues like they do. So I mean I think you have to take into account all the different. Uh, 
you know, items that you have to say grace over when you're, when you're considering tax policy. And what we're trying to do is something that's responsible for us that doesn't shake up our whole foundation of the way we're doing things. I think we can just take bites of the apple and do things that are prudent and, and be in a position where we can reassess and, and move forward in the future to, to take additional cuts. Why do, you th why do you think Mississippians should be in favor of the Senate plan versus the House plan that would eliminate the entire income tax? Well, I think that people, people should be in favor of, of good, responsible government, whatever that looks like. And, and if, if it's a, a blend of these two plans, if it's, you know, I don't know what the final plan will be like, but I think what they should be in favor of is, is, is a measured approach that's a responsible uh, tax that the, the government, you know, uh, puts in front of you to, to basically make sure you operate without jeopardizing everything that you, you're doing. All your funding is based on for things that I think everybody wants. Everybody wants roads. Everybody wants education. Everybody, you know, expects you to have uh, Department of Public Safety, corrections, uh, all these things that are, that are core functions of government. I think what, what Mississippians should be in favor of is a responsible approach to do those things and let any of the excess that's there because of growth or whatever reason, let's put it back in the hands of the taxpayers. I want to bring up a point that Senator Bryan uh, brought up. He was saying along something along the lines of, why should Mississippi be giving this money back to the taxpayers directly versus trying to invest in, say, like infrastructure or schools in the state? Well, I think you can do both. I think, you know, I think what we've learned is that, you know, Mississippians, when they get more money, they spend some of it. Some of it's saved, some of it leaks. But I think we can also invest in some of those things. I think we've, we've saved money. Our rainy day fund is, is statutorily full right now. I think in total we're making good decisions on investing in our state in those projects, maintaining the infrastructure, uh, whether it's buildings, uh, whether it's universities and colleges, junior colleges, uh, all those types of things, and yet also recognizing that, that there's a portion that can be returned to the citizens. Josh Harkins is chair of the State Senate Finance Committee. Coming up, we talk with U.S. Congressman from Mississippi, Benny Thompson. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. Today, we hear from Mississippi's 2nd District Congressman Benny Thompson. Thompson is the dean of the state's congressional delegation and the chair of the Committee on Homeland Security. He also chairs the Select Committee on the January 6th riot. And that is where our conversation begins. It's a work in progress. We've interviewed several hundred witnesses. We've collected uh, about 60,000 documents relative to January 6th. We continue to issue subpoenas for other witnesses to come. And basically, I appreciate the, the, the help that the public is giving our committee. A number of people have contacted us indicating, I think you ought to talk to so-and-so. And so the public involvement has been very good, but it's a work in progress. We're not rushing it. We want to get it right. And obviously our charge is to find the fact and circumstances that brought about uh, January 6th. Uh, you, you said you, you're doing your due diligence. You're taking your time. Uh, but it is an election year. There, um, There's some speculation by people who – project elections that the the house could swing in the 2022 election do you feel that you have the time resources and support to to continue the work that you're doing well we have the resources obviously we have a significant uh, staff we have uh, the technology associated with the staff to conduct our investigation our goal is mid-september to have a finished product we will have some additional hearings in the spring and into the summer so the public will get to see firsthand a lot of the work progress uh, product that the committee has produced. And so when you say hearings in the spring, you mean public hearings that will be accessible via live stream, television, et cetera? Well, uh, our goal right now is to 
demonstrate to the public uh, what we've found so far in, in what we consider prime time. You know, normal hearings are between 10 and 3 o'clock in the day. Uh, we are angling to have our hearings in the evening prime time so a majority of the people in this country can get to see for themselves firsthand what's happened. And is, is the reasoning for that is because you believe as a committee that the revelations that might come out in those hearings are, are, are that important to uh, the American public? Yes, when we tell the story, those who are open-minded will be able to reach their own conclusions. And I think it's important that we tell the story to as many people as we can. Now, I brought up the, the election. Um, it, is a, it is an election year. It's also a, 2020 was a census year. Uh, I know you've, out, you've been outspoken on what the redistricting committee in Mississippi came up with, and, and it is something that both passed the, the, the House and Senate and signed by the governor. Is there any recourse left? Um, I know you've been, you've been vocal in your challenging of the way that your district specifically was redrawn. Is, there, is that done, or do you, are you seeking other recourse uh, to challenge that map? Well, there's a contest going on in federal court at this point. Uh, NAACP is the lead plaintiff. Uh, they, are, they have disagreed with the plan drawn. Uh, I've also disagreed with the plan. You know, the burden should be a shared burden in redistricting. We all will represent around 770,000 people, uh, but I'll have over 40% of the land area, which uh, is difficult. Uh, commercial airports will virtually be non-existent. We have a small airport at Greenville, but if I wanted to go to the northern part of my district, I'd have to uh, go to Memphis. If I wanted to go to the southern part of my district, I'd have to go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. That's not sharing the burden. But I understand politics. You know, Republicans in the state of Mississippi in charge, and they want to make it as difficult as they can for a Democrat to get elected. We could have drawn a district it, that encompassed Hines and parts of Madison County, and we would have gotten the population needed uh, for equity uh, and apportionment, but we didn't get it. Uh, but, you know, I'm happy that in America we sell a lot of differences at the ballot box. Sometimes we win, sometimes we don't. Uh, one of the reasons I'm doing the January 6th commission is what people saw on January 6th is not who we are as Americans. Uh, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you don't tear the place up. You don't embarrass it. How can you tell your children uh, that when they lose a ball game, uh, they need to tear up the gym? Or when they lose a, a, a any kind of contest, you fight. We're better than that. So I hope to lead in this redistricting fight, uh, just like I lead in the January 6th fight. Uh, I take it to the court. If the court rules against me, you live to fight another day. But you don't throw a temper tantrum and tear up the place. And so it's time for adults to operate like adults, and Benny Thompson will continue to be an adult. That was Mississippi Congressman Benny Thompson speaking with MPB's Michael Guidry. We'll hear more from him on tomorrow's show. Still ahead, a new effort from the Attorney General's office eyes a future without abortion. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hi, I'm Jason Klein from Fix It 101. If you ever thought about changing the doorknob or fixing a leaky faucet, some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Desiree Frazier. The Office of Attorney General Lynn Fitch has launched an effort encouraging Mississippians to donate goods to 21 so-called life-affirming pregnancy centers in the state. This as the Supreme Court weighs the Dobbs abortion case that could undo the federally guaranteed right to the procedure in the U.S. The centers championed by the Attorney General are part of a collaborative called her plan. Anya Baker, who's with Her Plan, speaks with MPB's Rob Lane. 
I work to facilitate collaboration between assistance providers throughout the state in seven different categories of care. That includes pregnancy centers, but also includes other areas that women need service in, like mental health recovery, postpartum support, addiction recovery, housing, transportation, any area that a woman may need out of these seven broad categories that we cover. I am currently going around the state talking with people doing different service areas uh, throughout the state and hoping to include them all in a statewide directory that's easy to use. And currently you are working with the Attorney General's office in an attempt to uh, raise funds and attention and support for a number of these pregnancy centers in the state. This, of course, coinciding with the Supreme Court mulling over the Dobbs verse. Jackson Women's Health Organization abortion case. Talk a little bit about your relationship with the Attorney General's office and and how that collaboration came about. Yeah, I'm really grateful that the Attorney General seems to have an entire team that's dedicated to finding out what's going on on the ground. They don't seem like they're just concerned with policy. They truly are trying to put their ear to what the needs are. And so they turn to me because I'm in contact with a lot of different nonprofits and ministries throughout the state that are serving women to ask what are women in need of right now and how can we help these organizations that are on the ground, perhaps even with a shoestring budget at times, how can we help them continue to serve? And people need different things at different times. And so the best solution we came up with was, why don't we let them do their own Amazon list and tell us what they need the most? For some centers that looked like needing just car seats right now for parenting classes they're having. Uh, For some, it looked like items they need for group baby showers. So it's been exciting to have that connection from national policy all the way to a small rural town that's hosting a local event. Now let's dive a little deeper here. Uh, You mentioned that her plan supports these pregnancy centers, Mm -hmm. also a broader range of, of services for pregnant women. A common critique from people who support abortion rights of pregnancy centers say that they fundamentally exist to attempt to convince women to not get an abortion and perhaps fall short in in follow up in supporting a woman throughout a pregnancy and throughout raising a child. I imagine you would strongly object to that characterization. Can you tell us a little bit more from your perspective about what these pregnancy centers are? Yes, I've had the honor to visit a lot of pregnancy centers not just in the past years I've been working on this project, but as myself, a volunteer, um, having existing relationships with over 30 centers throughout the state. And each of one of them offer unique services. No two really seem to be the same, but I'm really impressed by the range of services they offer. So sometimes they offer classes that are certified by the state to go towards reunification when people are struggling Um, to keep their family together, or I've seen like anger management classes, things like Embrace Grace, which are programs that they work with in the community to facilitate 12-week courses of not just parenting skills, but also self-confidence and self-love and um, promoting the use of all kinds of skills throughout the community, all the way down to makeup artists and Uh, photographers to help women have free maternity shoots, um, have the needs that they need for a baby shower. And these relationships go on long after birth. I see the resource rooms for a lot of these centers with a lot of items and clothing for people way beyond pregnancy stage, clothes for women, clothes for older children. A lot of women already have children who find themselves pregnant Um, So I've really been impressed by the wide array of services. And, and of course, these centers have relationships with the nonprofits in their own community and do work shoulder to shoulder with a lot of other organizations. So they have direct referral processes for whatever they don't have in-house. And to be clear, if a pregnant woman were to walk into any one of these centers and say, hey, I am considering getting an abortion, the folks at any of those centers would counsel her not to do that? Um, The centers are very careful to not tell anyone what they should do, but instead allow them to facilitate their counseling options through 
their own critical analysis and there are licensed counselors involved to help with this um, and people who've come up with very strict curriculum to not ever make anyone feel coerced, to not ever make anyone uh, feel that they should do what someone in front of them thinks they should do, but um, instead to review the options before them. A lot of 50-cent words there. Is there a way you could restate that perhaps in layman's terms? Yes. So a woman always finds at these facilities that they have three options, parenting, adoption, or abortion, and they can access information for all three of those options. Pregnancy centers will not refer to abortion facilities. As you look at the Dobbs case, uh, how do you foresee uh, the, the future of abortion and abortion access in Mississippi and more broadly the future of pregnancy care in Mississippi? I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm really encouraged to see a lot of not just pregnancy centers, but wide arrays of nonprofits and churches and community organizations realize okay, if this policy changes and things look different in our state when it comes to pregnancy, then we need to prepare and we need to get together and decide where do we need to improve? What do we need to offer more of? And overwhelmingly, people are ready to answer that call. And so that's what I've been finding so encouraging. And if uh, the the case breaks in such a way that... um that it becomes possible to uh, ban all abortions in certain states. Obviously, the expectation would be that all or near all abortions would be banned in the state of Mississippi. And therefore, I imagine that these centers might need to brace for a notable uptick in clientele. Is that fair? Yes. And I think some of them already are seeing an uptick just from uh, centers that surround the state lines if people come from bordering towns and other states. And so they're getting a pre, pre-trial run of what if your numbers go up, what do we need to do to prepare? And I've been encouraged by their response. At this point, are you able to more or less make a promise to uh, women who are or may become pregnant in Mississippi that there is enough support in the nonprofit sector for them if the right to get an abortion goes away in the state? I think there's a lot of work to still be done, and I'm encouraged that groups are starting to realize how much more work is to be done, but I'm seeing all hands on deck, and it's looking really optimistic. Anya Baker is the Mississippi State Coordinator for Her Plan. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Stick around for a full morning of Mississippi Radio. Coming up at 9, it's Fix It 101. Then at 10, it's Everyday Tech. And at 11, don't miss Southern Remedy. Find past installments of this and other Think Radio shows online at mpbonline.org. I'm Desiree Frazier. See you tomorrow morning at 8.30 for the next Mississippi Edition only on MPB Think Radio. Have a good day.